So? Yeah. Ah. There you go. Okay. And when I switch it off? It should be off. It works. Indeed. Great. <laughs> I like it. I like all those things which are working. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Great. <laughs> we too. If you need any water, here's one or more. Grab it. Some. Are you waiting for me or? Yeah, good. So let's start again. Now we have the Dr. Walter Lux presentation from a label company. Dr. Walter Lux uh, work and develop a lot of new technologies for uh, optics and engineering education. And today, Dr. Uh, Walter Lux will present some new uh, ideas and new practical ideas to do education in photonics. So thank you, Dr. Val Walter Lux, to be here today. And let's start. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my special thanks goes to uh, Professor uh, Bagnato, because without his uh, action, I would not be here. We met us a couple of times in uh, international exhibitions. Last time it was in Mexico. And uh, I'm very happy uh, that I can be here now. I had the pleasure uh, to attend the opening ceremony on Sunday. And there was a lady conductor, directing conductor, and uh, of course it was held in, in, in Portuguese, which I do not understand. But there was one moment when she said, Viva da Luz! Oh, I said, my name is Luz, as you can read there. What a nice welcome! but nobody was looking at me, so I thought, it's not me, it's the light. So this is also, I'm sharing also that passion for light, as you did uh, most likely. And uh, today we, we dare also to show you here in front of you uh, direct pump jack laser system. My friends are always warning me, do not align the laser in front of an audience but uh, I'm confident that we will do that, and uh, uh, my younger colleague, Gaspar, will assist me in this regard. So, it's, we heard it many times here that the fascination of light, the giver of light, has always held a great fascination for human beings. We can see it, feel it's warm on our skin, but we cannot touch it. So the question, what is light, is very old. Even it gave nuts to Archimedes and the ancient Greek thought the light was an extremely fine kind of dust. Uh, fortunately, it's not the case, otherwise we were walking now in, in meters of dust of the photon. And he published his first or let's say a book in optics, the so-called Catoptrica, but the uh, book has been lost. But the wording for light in Greek is photon. Luz in your language, in Greek, photon. So the word photon, in relation of the light, comes from that ancient Greeks. And the ancient Greeks, they love to play with nature, they love to play with the amber, and from that amber, the word, word electron came up. Electronics, photonics, these are words, meanwhile, of high importance. And if we raise the question, what actually is photonics? And it answers, let me start with the electronics. So everywhere when electron 
is created, moving or will be detected, then we talk about electronics. And in the same way, wherever a photon will be created, we're talking about photonics. Meanwhile, a huge area. And we know now that this century is addressed to the photons. The last century was addressed to the electrons. You see already that the photons are taking over the job of the electrons more and more and more. Best example is the telecommunication in that area. Let's have a little closer look to what photonic is. We can see here each product, whatever it is, consists minimum out of mechanics or it may consist out of electronics or out of optics. And if you are in the business of just mechanics, that means you will have a high competition worldwide. Meanwhile, you can buy a CNC machine and start to produce high precision mechanics. Same in electronics. But if, that was the wrong note, okay. But if you go into the overlap of electronics and mechanics, we are in the field of mechatronics. And in this field, the competition is less. The same is holds true for the electro-optics and, of course, for the optomechanics. And this white area, the combination of mechanics, electronics and optics, this is, in fact, the technology flagship where you will find the photonics as well. Here, just a brief overview on the importance of photonic products. If these numbers are stemming from uh, 211, and these are only the figures for the laser sources. And we see already here in telecommunication, telecommunica we have the highest uh, amount of use of lasers and material processing, lithography, data storage. So this relates already to 38,000 employees. They are just working in the field of creating and manufacturing laser sources. When we are talking about photonics, we basically mean, in the past, laser sources, laser technology. And we're talking about laser sources. My mouse seems to have a problem. So, here you see it, a short overview on the most important laser systems. It starts all with the ruby laser. Uh, this is not the first ruby laser. On the first ruby laser, I will report a little bit that with the ruby laser, the new technology started and changed the society, definitely. The second laser which has been invented, developed, was the so-called Heaney laser. And still, the Heaney laser has a big, big application, but nobody knows it. But I will lift a little bit the curtain and we will have a look where we're still using this gas laser. And definitely, here this type, this what not, I mean this one here, computer, do it like as I wish, okay. So this tiny little diode laser definitely changed our world change telecommunication. So without these small laser types, there is no internet, no mobile phone, and all these convenient things which we are enjoying today. The next class of lasers came up, the so-called diode pump laser systems. They gained a lot of application. Basically, the green laser pointer, but the newest class of laser which came up very recently are the so-called fiber laser. And these are incredible laser systems. Out of such a fiber, you can already, nowadays, extract 100,000 watt of optical power. That is sufficient that I could cut this all into two pieces. And uh, once I had the opportunity to give a lecture at the uh, Petroleum Institute in Abu Dhabi, First of all, I thought, what the hell, the, 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 the oil people want to do with photonics. And then I learned that 
And that moment when they are coming, the drilling on a hard rock, they need a huge amount, more than 10 megawatt of energy, of power, to drill through this hard rock. And also using diamond uh, blades for the driller. But now they are using such a fiber laser, bringing it down to the rock, melting it, continue the drilling. So one of the very surprising applications of the lasers. Another very important aspect is the so-called laser metrology. That means measurement with laser. Here we see an example of the so-called LIDAR system, or LIDAR. Maybe you know the radar system, radio wave detection and ranging. And instead of radio waves, we're using here laser intensity. So it's light detection and ranging. We are sending out a laser beam into the atmosphere. And we can do two things. We first can measure when we get the first backscatter's light. Or the second part of the story, we can analyze then spectroscopically uh, the uh, composition of uh, the backscattered light and can get an idea about the pollution or other ingredients in that atmosphere. CNC calibration, extremely important. In front of the machine, you are seeing a Heaney laser, a frequency stabilized Heaney laser. And this is a secondary standard for the meter. That means we can calibrate the CNC machines, which is important. So after, let's say, half year of operation in industry, this machine are warning out and they need to be calibrated again against the standard. Otherwise, you start to create junk. And here is something, also an application of the Heaney laser, which is so important for the society, but nobody knows it. Each time you're entering an aeroplane, you will find more than three or four of these sy systems on board of the aeroplane. They need it for navigation. Without these, we could not navigate, we could not fly even. We say, we, we, say, we have GPS for that, for what we need this uh, laser gyroscope. Yeah, the GPS is in the hand of our American friends. Whenever they want, they can switch it off. So that means, by law, each plane must have its own navigation system. And it's used still by these laser gyroscopes. So in addition, this laser gyroscope was an invention which has been driven by the so-called Cold War. I see some young people here. M most likely they do not remember that time. There was a time when we in Germany, we had this iron curtain going from the north down to the south of Germany. Not only dividing the country, also dividing the entire world. On the right side, we had the communism. On the left side, the capitalism. So we could calculate very easily how much it will take that a Russian fighter, which will start in Moscow, coming to, to West Germany. It was half an hour. Well, to that times, our planes have been operated with mechanical gyroscopes. It was in the, you know, the Cold War was in the 60s, 70s. So that means such a mechanical gyroscope needs to spin up 20 minutes. It's not fast enough to react in time. So all these fighters, they had to be on power 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and so on and so on, so permanently powered. So after the idea came back to the Sanyak effect and the laser gyroscope has been invented very quickly. So this is one also of the inventions. And this is a tragedy of the photonics. It is so important for the humankind, but nobody knows it except the experts. And that's why we celebrate the year of light. Viva da luz in this term. And I hope I can light the passion for that to you as well. So, optics, of course, belongs to the photonics. So what the uh, condensers and resistors are for electronics, lenses and prisms and so on, are used in the so-called classical optics. 
fiber optics, very important, telecommunication. And the electronic people, they need just to connect two copper wires in order to establish a uh, connection, but for the optical fibers we need some special tools and arrangement so that we can uh, 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 weld the fibers to each other and put connectors to that. So in that moment, if let's say a young talented engineer has this equipment which is not so expensive, he can start already his own business in helping maintaining existing optical fiber networks. Optoelectronics is one of the most important parts also for the photonics and my engineers, electronic engineers will forgive me when I'm also seeing the electronics within the photonics, but it's true. Meanwhile, we know that photonics does not go without electronics. Imaging and vision, of course, cameras are part of the photonics. Here you see an example for laser active night vision. Here on top we have a camera. Here we have some diode lasers which are emitting in the infrared, near infrared ray, uh, region which the camera can see. This is the image without the laser. That one is with the switched laser on. So also photonics is used in photonics, uh, excuse me, in surveillance. And also for long distance security, let's say uh, a laser light barrier for protecting pipelines or the circumference of an airport. Let me briefly tell you something a little bit about how the laser happened. The person on the left side you will not know, most likely not, but I know him quite well. He's my doctor father. So in, in Germany, or in German we say doctor father, that means he was my supervisor when I worked for my PhD. And this creates a long life relationship. He considers himself as a father and we are his sons. And uh, then from time to time when we are sitting together talking about uh, how the laser happened. And when the laser happened, he was in the United States. We have to consider the year 1958, 59, something like that. I see only young faces here for the compliment. <laughs> so maybe you do not remember that the Russians launched, the Russian launched the first satellite, the Sputnik. Uh, and the Sputnik was cruising around the Earth, beep, 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 beep. It was annoying the President of the United States to such an extent that he said, how it is possible that our enemy to that time is ahead of us. Because the Russians have been the first nation having an outer space satellite. And within 24 hours, a lot of money has been pumped. The White House agreed immediately upon the research on outer space. One of the key components, which already exists, was the so-called MESA. So Charlotte and Towns already predicted that, and the MESA was important because it was a microwave amplification by stimulated emitted radiation. And these amplifiers were necessary to amplify the weak signals which are coming from the satellites. So this was a key component in that story. So there was overnight a lot of money available. And my doctor father, Mr. Welling, he was at the time in the United States, as I mentioned already. And as a German, you know, we are very accurate. So he has been nominated to read the uh, proposals and to distribute the fund. And it happened that he got a proposal from a person, Theodore Maiman. You know, Theodore Maiman, he created the first laser, the Ruby laser, in 1960. And 
Here we see this picture from Mr. Maiman. The press has been taken from him, maybe 24 hours after the news has been spread. Oh, that was a good news for the United States. Now we have the laser. Now we have a lethal weapon against Russia. That's what my doctor father tells us, told us. And next day, the press people rushed into the laboratory of Mr. Mayman, expecting to see the lethal weapon. The only thing we can show was a small, tiny laser rod and the flashlight. Maybe that was the reason that he never got the Nobel Prize. We don't know that. And, sorry, Mr. Mayman. And the press people have never seen the ruby laser beam. You have to imagine to that time a discharge of a flash lamp was required. In that moment, when Mayman released this discharge, it makes a bang like a gunshot. And su surprisingly, everybody was closing their eye. But in that moment, the laser has been emitted. So nobody of the press people has seen a laser at all. And you see he is holding here in his hand the small ruby laser. Oops. And one of, he has three of these samples. One of the samples he gave to Professor Welling. And once I had the pleasure to have this in my hand, I have to say it was a very touchy moment because this laser changed society in an incredible way. Nobody knew that to that time. But it was like that. So this is cradle of a new technology. And in December 1960, the second laser has been invented from Ali Yavan. You see, it's a December 1960. There was a cold day, it was shortly before Christmas. Snow was a little bit drizzling around, and Mayman planned to make his last experiment concerning the Heaney laser. A few rooms apart, the director of boards of Bell Labs, Bell Telephone, they had a board meeting. And one point on the agenda was, shall we fire Mr. Yavan? Because it took a long time. He spent a lot of money for that. On that day, as I mentioned before Christmas, Yavan had all the things together and he went into his lab, aligned everything carefully, evacuated the tube, put in the required amount of the gases, and boom, it worked! It worked. It's such a, such a joy for him. And he was so pleased about that, but he could jump directly into the meeting of the directors, but he has been held away from that by the secretary. So he took a small piece of paper, just short note, it is running. It runs CW, that means continuously, because the ruby laser was a pulse laser system. And of course, Bell Labs Telephone, they had the idea they want to make data communication. So they needed a continuously operating source. So that was then the invention of Mr. Yavan. And still, we are using his invention in the aeroplane. Now, if we are on the way to honor the <coughs> masters of optics, we have to go back a little bit further in history and see what Archimedes did. The Battle of Syracuse. The idea of Archimedes was, you know that most likely, if you do not know it from history, maybe you know it from the Mistbusters, from that series in the United States. So he tried to set ships fire by using touch the mirror. We know now, meanwhile, it's not impossible, but it's not very probable that he did that in that way. Another person which needs to be mentioned is Ibn al Haytham. And that's why we are celebrating the Year of Light 2015. 
So that means 1,000 years after publishing his book, this, uh, this famous Kitab al-Manazir. So Ibn al-Haytham was born in Basra. It's a city in, in Iraq. And as a young man, he went to Cairo to find his fortune in 1969. Cairo just was a new city, new upcoming city, and he was, had a very uh, bright mind. And uh, he, to such an extent, even that after two years, the ruler of Cairo, or the governor of Cairo, asked him to come. And the ruler gave him the order to tame the Nile. You know, the Nile is the river which is going through all over the uh, middle of Africa down to Alexandria, where it terminates in the Mediterranean Sea. And at that time, when the snow was melting in the mountains, the Nile has a lot of water and was flooding parts of the new city. The new marble stones were covered by dirt, and the ruler does not like that. So came the Nile. Even al Haytham, he was smart enough to know that he could not do that. But he also knows when he will say no, he will simply be killed. So the way out of the disaster is he pretended he became mad overnight. It saved his life, but he has been put to prison. And a small cell, but there was a small, I will not say a window, but a hole in the wall where from time to time the sun came shining in. And he started to think on light, property of light. And he made experiment, whatever he had, with some stones, with his cutlery or something like that. And when the governor died, he has been released from his prison. And he went back to his home country, to the University of Baghdad. And in Baghdad, he continued his ideas about that. And then he published his famous book, the so-called Kitab al manazir This is an Arabic word. Kitab stands for book. al manazir is the view. And this book has been published in 1050. So exactly 1,000 years ago, that's why we have celebrating the year of light. And because it was in 1015, 1015, all other inventions which took place having a five in the end of that year will be also honored during this year of light. And it has already been translated in 1219 to Latin, which is very surprising, because translating and making a book to that time was not quite easy, so the book must be very important. And uh, it had even been printed in 1527 in Basel. Basel is a Switzerland uh, town, and on the front page of the book we see this beautiful picture here. I want to zoom it out a little bit what we can see here. So it's a kind of encoding inside uh, that book here. I mean, the ladies may forgive me, but uh, it's uh, printed like that. You see here a man standing in the water and his legs are bended so that we are, can see here the principle of the refraction. And this gentleman here is looking into a mirror and sees himself somewhere. So the idea of reflection has been treated already in his book. And three-dimensional view. You see here this rich and pure three-dimensional view. And of course, the Battle of Syracuse with the mirrors lighting the ships to fire. So this and other things are given in that book. So he is treating then the rectilinearity, oh, what, a, what a word, a rectilinearity, that means that light is propagating in, in straight lines. The reflection I mentioned, refraction, and of course, arguments and evidence for that, what he has written.
and already Roger Bacon has the opportunity to have a look into that Kitab al-Manazir and he started already figuring out some ideas about prisms and, and lenses and then something very strange thing happened to a monk, 1310. So also these monks are living in dark cells, as I mentioned, also in the case of Ibn al Haytham, but he has also a small window where the light comes through that, and it happened that he took some water and he swallowed, and then he sprayed it out, and then he saw a rainbow. Wow, he was a monk. He knows the, the believing of the Christians that only God can set the rainbow into the sky as a reminder that he will never bring back the big water or the big flood. So this monk was very desperate. What? Am I God? He believed in that moment. Of course most not. And some of other optical mirrors, miracles happened to that times, so that the Roman Church decided to put René Descartes on the payroll. Most likely you know the person. If not, you're using one of his inventions as a Cartesian cross. Ah, that comes from that guy, Descartes, Cartesian cross. And he had to explain these miracles also a little bit modified in the way how the church wanted to hear that. And that brought up Isaac Newton later on. Isaac Newton was so upset about one thing he uh, discard, mentioned that the purest light is a white light. That's fine for the church. White is a color of virginity. It fits. But Good old Isaac Newton started now to go into the optics. Before that he was good in mechanics and so on and he made this famous experiment with the prisms. And he could verify unambiguously that the white light consists out of different separate colors. So René Descartes was wrong to that time. So we could now honor a lot of people I love to put Max Planck onto the screen. I could have chosen Einstein, I could have chosen Faraday, I could have chosen many others. But Planck was the only one who saved the physics around 1900. You have to see what happened to that time. A young talented physicist sat down and he wanted to calculate the spectral distribution of a hot body. Oh, good idea. He started writing down equation, equation, equation. He comes to a result standing in front of him, but when he analyzed that, it was totally wrong because it shows that the intensity to the shorter wavelengths should become infinite, which was in contradiction to the, to the measurement. Oh, he said, most likely I made a mistake. And he took another two or three weekends to go over and over again. Well, we could not find any mistake. Then he gave the work to his colleagues. Could not find a mistake. So there was a moment when we used all our knowledge in physics, resulting in a mistake. When it will happen again? But Max Planck. He could lead us out of this catastrophe, it's called the UV catastrophe, by finding this Planck's constants. And so I believe he was so important for the physics. I mean, later on, he also paved the way for the quantum mechanics by finding this H. And that's why I'm putting him here on that honor roll. As we know already, 1960, we had the invention of the first laser, and 1991 we launched the first experimental laser, which you see here on the screen. It's a YAG laser. It has been firstly shown by Goizek et al. 
also of Bell Laboratories, and became later on the most important laser systems. And you might see the same system here on the table now, it's the same system. And it's the uh, most important system for education because it's part of all lecture books when you come to the so-called four level laser systems. Let me last briefly explain you how it works so that we can understand what we're doing later on here on the table. So at the beginning, the YAC, or neodymium YAC, has been pumped by flash lamps. But the efficiency was not that high because most of the light uh, was, uh, was not absorbed by the neodymium YAC and was simply wasted. So when the diode lasers came up, they fit very nicely into the absorption bands of the neodymium YAC rod. And before we can make use of the light of the laser diode, we have to collimate that and to focus it here into that neodymium YAC rod, having here on the back side already cavity mirror, and we have here the second cavity mirror. I see some students here. Are you already aware about what a laser is? You know what a laser is? Yeah, so, 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 so. Okay, you, you know the, 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 the Bohr's atom. The atom, the model of the atom from Bohr. Now we know we have, we have a core and we have electrons. They are cruising around that core. And you know also if we shine in energy, it may happen that the electron will be elevated or lifted in a higher orbit. And then the electron is cruising in a higher, higher orbit. Oh, it's so happy, it's so excited. Yeah, it's like us when we are traveling. We are excited. But after a couple of days, oh, it's tired, homesick, want to go home. The same happened to the electron. It goes down from the excited orbit down to the ground state. But the electron is so fair, it gives back its energy, which will be emitted as a photon. Now the photon starts to travel. Oh. And after a while, it sees another atom, which is excited. And he's talking to the atom. Hey, atom, I see you have an excited electron. I know after a while it will come down anyhow. So order it down so that it can travel with me. The atom said, why not? Electron come down. Electron emits a photon. So now we're already two in our group. Light amplification. Yeah? We talked about light amplification by stimulated emitted radiation. So the first photon has been created by spontaneous emission. He said, no, I'm, I don't want to, uh, electron goes down. But the second one, it has been triggered by the first one, stimulated. Uh, so we have now the stimulated process. And you can imagine these two photons are very happy, but if they come across to other excited atoms, they become more and more and more. And then one splendid engineer came on the idea, put a mirror here, so that the photons need to go back into the wood of the excited atoms, will be amplified further and further. And a very smart engineer put, said, let's put us also here a mirror. And then the photons are bouncing forth and back, going always through the wood of the excited atoms and they become more and more and more until they form a beam of light. That's the laser. That's all. The same happens here in the neodymium yak rod. Today I learned neodymium is a rare earth which you have in Brazil here. And in fact, this, this neodymium is the active material, this atom which has the electrons and which we can excite. And the X stands for yttrium aluminium garnet. I also learned this morning this yttrium you have here in Brazil. So the only thing you have to do is take a pot, go to that beach where you can find this yttrium, mix, mix it with aluminium powder in a pot, make it hot, leave it a while, and then slowly pull out a crystal. OK, 
takes you only a couple of months, don't worry. Yeah, and out of that crystal, oh, I forgot to mention, sprinkle some neodymium into the pot. Uh, otherwise, we don't have active atoms. So this is the way how this active material, neodymium yak rod, will be created. And you can identify already, we have here on the, on the left side one mirror, and on the right side the other mirror. So that the photon scan work can move forth and back. Okay. And the teachers, professors here, they know already what's written in the textbooks. And the students will also be treated by this items emission and absorption four level laser system, lifetime of excited state. Now this is something very nice because let me just briefly show you what it is. We have here the same neodymium yak rod, but instead of exciting the atoms permanently, we are switching the excitement periodically on and off. Uh, you see here, we put it on and off. And we are only interested in the fluorescence light, which we can block the pump light with such a filter and with a photo detector. The photo detector takes the signal, and on the oscilloscope, we see such a distribution. So you see here, again, we switch off the laser, and normally you would expect if we switch off the light in the room, the light is off. No, but not in this case here. So we have here a decay of the photons, which takes a certain time. And this is the lifetime of the excited state. Why I'm figuring it out? Because we can measure this lifetime here, like we can measure the half time of a radioactive uh, material or condenser, whatever. But if you take the inverse value of that lifetime, we have the Einstein coefficient for the spontaneous emission. So in this point, Einstein comes into the laser scenery. Some of my colleagues are telling, try to tell that Einstein predicted the laser. No, he did not. He predicted the spontaneous emission, simulated emission and the absorption. So this is one of the, I guess, worldwide simple experiments to measure the lifetime of the excited state and these Einstein coefficient for spontaneous emission. When I was a student, I have seen it just on the blackboard. The professor was writing the lines and said, this is that, this is that, this is that. I believe that because, you know, students know that they believe that. But never believe everything what's written in physics books. And maybe you were running into the, the same trouble with the UV catastrophe. Uh, so the time is ready for the next catastrophe. That reminds me on, on one thing, maybe you heard that a couple of months ago, or even a year ago, the uh, research center in Switzerland, CERN, C-E-R-N. They made an announcement in press. Very careful, very careful. We believe that we might have seen that the speed of light is higher than Einstein predicted. That was the story. Can you imagine what will happen if they are true? A couple of weeks later, they had to walk back a bit. Say, oh, there was a problem with the fiber optics from Italy coming the time and was not correct. And we are very sorry. I, I, I spoke to one of the persons in that group. I said to him, listen, if you're interested in measuring the speed of light, come to me. I have an experiment for that. It's more precise what you did. So it may happen day by day that such new things coming up. Also, what is light? Is it, is it, it's a wave, is it a particle? Meanwhile, light is particle and wave. So meanwhile, if somebody asks me, uh, uh, can I explain what, is, what, what light is? I say, no, I can't. What do you believe? It will come true. So in that moment, when you start to carry out or perform an experiment concerning the property of light, you already figuring out in your mind the result. That means you are thinking on an experiment which shows you a wave, the light is friendly, 
it appears as a wave. If you're thinking on your experiment already, in, you do not need to perform that experiment. You can just think on that. Is it the particle? It comes as a particle. Think it's particle and wave together. It comes out like that. So the light is very friendly, but we will. I, for my case, I say, I do not know what light is. And if somebody comes up telling you he knows what light is, don't believe him. So that's related also here to Einstein. Okay, there are some other topics which are of interest then for, for teaching. Let me go just one, one further. And coming to the exciting nonlinear optics. And this brings us very quickly to the experiment we want to show you here. Second harmonic generation, what does it mean? We have the same setup as before. One mirror here, one mirror inside. Here we have a fundamental wave of the neodymium Jag laser. And now we put some tricks here into we put a piece of crystal into the cavity and suddenly green light will come out of it. That's what we're gonna do now here. And for that purpose, I will switch on now near the camera. Maybe Gaspar, I need your help. So I mentioned already we're using a diode laser. The diode laser, which you see here. This is here the diode laser for exciting the neodymium yak drop. Maybe the camera can see that radiation here. Yeah, we, it is 808 nanometer, so it's not quite well visible to the camera, but you can see that this bit, what you see as well is the light is, it's not round, it's an elliptical beam with a high dimension, which is typical, typically for diode lasers. And before we can make use of it, we need to collimate the light of the diode laser, and for that we need to use here such a collimator, which is an, a lens, which has a high numerical aperture and a very short focal length, because we want to catch most of the light here into that. So I'm placing that here now onto the, onto the rail, and can you Hold the camera and look to the target screen, please. So we have here a target screen. And my aim is now to focus the laser in such a way that it's <coughs> you see this bluish point on the target screen here. In fact, this light here is red. If you directly look to here, you see it, it's red. And then already we, we notice another mistake in the physics books. If we are considering the sensitivity curve of the human eye, we should be blind beyond 750 nanometer, but we can see it here. Okay, I'm aligning now in, in such a way that I have an almost parallel beam here along the path. That's the case right now. So now we have here the radiation of the diode laser, which is almost parallel. It's very hard to get parallel light from a diode laser. So I want to show you now here the Jag rod. You see this shiny thing here? A little bit greenish, not very sharp. Okay, I'll move it out of the holder. We did not train that, what we are currently doing here, so uh, maybe not everything will be perfect. You see here now the greenish looking part. This is the Yak rod. It's a small rod which has a diameter of three millimeter and it's five millimeter long. And as I already mentioned, it had 
already one mirror on its backside, forming also the cavity mirror. So, before we can now make use of the light, we need to focus it down more. So this is the back for that. So I'm putting now a simple focusing lens here now onto the rail. And now I should expect that somewhere there should be a focus. Oh yes, you see this here? It's burning even. But only on, on black surfaces. If I put my finger here into that, nothing will happen because it will be completely absorbed. So uh, you can also already stu study here laser material processing because I made some burn some holes here into my, my business card, uh, which you can see here on that card. So at, at this position, I should place then the Yagrod, which I'm doing now here, so approximately here. And now we're already pumping the exciting neodymium atoms. But we cannot see anything because the creative fluorescence light is 1064 nanometer. So by using such an infrared converter, you might see here it's shining up. I'm closing it now here. So the fluorescence coming out of the neodymium yak. I make it a little bit more exciting. I'm modulating now the diode laser. And you see here the fluorescence light which goes in all room directions for the moment. And this is what we, what we measure with the photo detector and determine then the, the lifetime of the excited state. Optical pumping so far, emission absorption. Now, as I mentioned, we're placing now a cavity mirror into the story and I'm not sure if that what I'm seeing here is fluorescence or laser action or whatever it is. I'm putting here a filter which only lets pass radiation beyond 1000 nanometer. Oh, there is something. Okay, the laser, the YAG laser is working already now. I'm putting off the, the modulation. Okay, now I can align a little bit. So you can see that in my having my fingers. So the good thing of such a YAG laser is that the gain is very high. So we do not need any pre-alignment for that, as in the case of the Hini laser. And now I would like to show you something very nice. Can we switch off the light a bit? Is it possible? To make it a little bit more exciting. So I have here, I can show until we have light, we have here this kind of crystal and what I'm doing now is a small mirror. I have nothing here in my arms, but believe me, so I'm putting now this piece of material. Wow! Green light appears from out of nothing, basically. How is possible? When we, we had almost near infrared radiation, hardly can be seen with our eye, and boom, see it here, green light comes out of it. Any ideas? I know your professors know that. Okay, this is frequency doubling. Uh, frequency doubling? Never heard from that, yeah? I'm talking to the students now. So, we are here now in the field of nonlinear optics. And, to understand the nonlinear optics, we have to understand in a very short way the interaction with light and matter. I was always fascinated when I have just a simple lens and light goes through that, the light will be affected by that lens. I always ask my, myself the question, what the hell is the interaction between the glass and the light? When I was an older student, okay, I understood the Maxwell equation. Okay, write it down. 
So we know the, 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 uh, the light consists out of an electromagnetic vector and uh, uh, electromagnetic vector, so it means electrical field and a magnetic field. If there should be an interaction, then there should be free electrons in the glass. But the glass is an insulator. So this is not good, the idea. Then I'm checking the magnetic component, but there are no magnetic dipoles inside the glass. So what actually is the interaction between the light and matter? There must be something. Yes, you are smiling, you know the result already, because the glass forms or has a kind of molecules and they are forming dipoles. Uh, now it comes clear, when if there is a dipole, this is in, uh, a load on the stick, you have a positive load, negative load, and when the electrical field comes, okay, now the dipole starts to move and we have our interaction. Fine. So this dipole then re-emits the light with the same frequency. But it may happen that the field strength becomes that high that the dipole cannot follow any longer linearly the incoming field. That means distortions are taking place. What you know from the Hooke's law and with the spring, yeah, if you extend it too far, then the reaction is not any longer linear. And then the next step is, in such cases, Fourier transformation, and then we see first harmonic, second harmonic, and so on. Second harmonic we created here, of course. Second harmonic means half of the wavelength, 1064 nanometer, half of it 532 nanometer. So, that's Greek. So this is our small experiment, but we are not finished with that. Now I need my assistant again with the white sheet of paper. Now I'm putting this filter, it's a, a filter which blocks the infrared radiation, just, just for security purposes. I'm opening now here the laser and you will see, what? This is the laser? Yes, it's the laser. How we can tame that, I will show you later. Just for optical cavity, we have here a flat mirror, a curved mirror. It's too bright for you? Don't worry, the intensity is very low. Then, then keep make it like this here. So. No, can you see, hold it back? Can you still see that green? Go further. No. And there's a so-called stability criteria for optical cavity. We have a 100 millimeter radius of curvature, and that means if we extend then this range beyond 100 millimeter, then the laser oscillation should stop. Okay, let's do that. So I'm moving now the, you see the mold becoming bigger and bigger and larger. Oh. Go further, further. And then the moment comes, maybe you see already here the sharp curvature of the mirror, that means the photons are going over the edge of the mirror and one step further, boom, the laser is up because the optical stability criterion is not fulfilled. I'm coming back. I see horrible numbers of so-called transverse modes. And uh, normally we expect the laser point is a nice round point. Now it's a torsion beam PM00, but we have here, due to the high gain, and the hemispherical cavity, the possibility of non-axial modes. That means the laser is also oscillating in uh, other room directions, only just in the center of that. And to tame those modes, I'm using here such an iris. So it's, it's, it's an adjustable hole. If, yeah, you see that? Okay. I put this here now into the cavity, and this, and now I'm closing this iris, and the, you see already the numbers of modes are decreasing. Goes it even further? 
And then we see here already the TUM to zero. One zero. And goes it even a little bit further. Zero zero now. So now we have a laser as you want to have the laser. But this is matter of engineering. So this is so far the practical demonstration of the laser system. And now we are going a little bit back. I want to tell you something more about other laser systems and about practical education in photonics. So, but if you wish, afterwards you may come to the table here and we can play a little bit with the laser system. Okay. So far we learned here a little bit about the, the first, the Ruby laser system, which has been invented by Mayman. And the tragedy of the, the Ruby laser is that the, the laser terminates in the ground state, we know that, so that uh, there's a problem to create then the population inversion. I want to s explain our population inversion, now I will stop with that. Uh, so. Uh, but you know, should know population inversion is required for the laser process. And here in the YAC laser system, we have the so-called four-level system, which means the, the, the laser ground state is not the ground state itself. And these levels here are normally not populated. So as soon as we have some excitation or population with excited atoms, we will create laser radiation in 1064. This was a good idea of the neodymium yak laser. And we should not forget the good old Hini laser, which has been invented by Ali Yavan. And this will be also a little bit uh, the background of the next consideration. Yavan itself did only use the infrared lines of these transitions here, and two years later then the visible lines has been, uh, by Ritken et al., they have been found. And here you see such a Hini laser tube, which is very common. Now the active material is a gas instead of uh, as a solid state, two mirrors, and so it looks like nowadays for training, education, how this works. You want to see here a short movie. So it starts, we need to align such a system with a pilot laser. We need a reference so that we can align later on the mirrors. And we're using such an iris as a reference for the mechanical axis. The beam is not aligned, so we have to bring the uh, beam to the center of the, of the iris. Now we align the tube with respect to the green beam so that the laser beam can pass through that uh, capillary. So this is, takes normally a long time uh, for the students. You will find students doing it in 15 minutes, in uh, 30 minutes, two hours, and infinite. Uh, this is they never succeed, and this is already something uh, to see the ability of the students. So uh, for research labs, you know, on, need not only to have brain, but also the ability to work with your hands. And uh, this is already the first test how the alignment capabilities of the students appear. 
Now the second laser mirror is introduced into the setup. And with your light, and the idea is that we bring the beams together in such a way that it forms one line. And you can see here then the back reflect, the strong one is the important one, which has to go into the center. And if the second mirror is aligned as well, you see here the back reflector needs to go to the center. It appears here, and when they are aligned nicely, then you see interference fringes, and you know, okay, the mirrors are aligned parallel to each other. And then the exciting moment comes. We are putting now the laser tube, which is already now switched on, and uh, in 80%. You already have laser operation, but if not, you have to scan a little bit and you see the red light flashes up, so the EE laser is working. And then a variety of, of uh, uh, measurements start, output power, stability criteria, and so on. So although the Heaney laser is not used that frequently, it has been the first continuous laser. This is the first barcode reader worked with the Heaney laser and so on, but it has not been beaten so far. We get a perfect Gaussian beam out of it, very long coherence lengths, and a high frequency stability. Frequency stability. No, where is my mouse? My mouse is okay. And the good idea is to work with such a system as a laser gyroscope. You see here is set up, we have not only two mirrors, we have three mirrors here, forming a ring cavity. And uh, this is, the idea is based on the so-called Sanyak effect. Sanyak who was a physicist who made such a so-called Sanyak interferometer and he believed that he got an evidence that we need in ever again. And this brought up Michelson again. Michelson, that guy with the interferometer, Michelson interferometer. And in fact, there was in the United States a showdown with the press people. Because Michelson just finished his experiment with his colleague uh, Morley and he verified that the ever is not existent. And then Tanya comes up with that idea. And so the press has been invited. Michelson set up a 600 meter long interferometer and he said, gentlemen, the only thing what we're going to measure here is the rotation of the Earth, nothing else. So he was very polite. And uh, these, as I mentioned at the beginning already, the Sanyak interferometer or this laser gyroscope is used for navigation and how such a system works. We measure absolute rotation. We're studying ring laser setup, and you see now we are rotating the laser system. We have a mode which propagates clockwise, and we have a mode which propagates counterclockwise. And when we are turning the system, we can measure the optical beat frequency of both modes. This is very strictly linear to the rotation rate of the gyroscope. Here we nicely see the triangular laser cavity and as we exit the beams coming out under a specific angle and these beams will be brought to interference. And once these beams are aligned, and you see already these interference fringes are coming up and with the photo detector we can simply measure then the beat frequency of the rotation. So still a very important application. And these speed frequencies are in the range of 80 kilohertz, depending on the speed.
No, we have seen a lot of photonics examples, applications, and meanwhile we see that the photonics is dividing into two main streams. The one is the photonics for engineers, or what the engineers are doing with the photonics, and still the photonics and physicists. And what the difference is, I would like to show you in a short video. Uh, in the first video I'm showing you laser material processing, and right after that a movie from NASA will come. And I would like to, if you can try to understand what NASA is telling us. So we are starting that one here. What engineers are doing with photonics? Of course, we will lose laser material processing. See, photons are cutting the steel. Photons cutting the steel. Like they're cutting something in butter. And this laser processing definitely is the backbone of the uh, German industry, and meanwhile, also of other industries. Isn't it amazing? Photonics and engineers. Now the movie from NASA comes, please try to understand the text. Remember these? Laser light made records obsolete. NASA is on the verge of doing the same thing with space-based communications. Before the end of the decade, the laser communication relay demonstration mission will revolutionize the way we move tons of data from orbit to ground and all around the solar system. The demand for vast transmission capability grows exponentially. Sensors are gathering more data than ever. Sophisticated command and control software talks more and asks more. Conventional radio frequency transmissions can't meet the need. That's why engineers at Goddard and partners like MIT Lincoln Lab, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and Space Systems Loral are working on the next generation of high data rate, low mass optical systems. Their goals are nothing short of imagining the future and bringing it to life. Imagine live, high definition video feeds from far away places in the solar system. That's the promise of LaserCom. The beauty of LaserCom is its scalability. Missions will see profound improvements, with speeds increasing from 10 to 100 times over today's RF transmissions. And huge bandwidth improvements are just the beginning. Reductions of hardware mass and power demands will see equivalent savings. Smaller communication systems mean more efficient power management, and more efficient power management unlocks a wealth of potential engineering options for other systems. LaserCom is just one part of NASA's new initiative to commercialize space. This particular demonstration will hitch a ride on a Loral communications satellite in 2017. Once on orbit, control of the optical module will be turned over to NASA Goddard for testing. Two-way data transmissions from ground stations at White Sands, New Mexico, and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California will put the system through its paces. But just a few years after a successful demonstration, NASA's own telecommunications relay system could be replaced with the more advanced hardware. Data transmission by laser light, that's a bright idea. And as a means for moving huge amounts of data efficiently and effectively, it's the communications backbone of ambitious plans for the nation's future in space.
So we will have two very important messages from NASA. First of all, in 2017, they want to establish the entire communication, outer, outer space communication, done by lasers. That is great. The good news for us laser people, for, for the photonic community. But as far as I know, now that they have more in their mind. If they start optical communication, then the way is not far away from also optical communication on Earth. Everybody of you most likely is using touch and mobile phone. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, medical doctor's research show that it will harm us, harm our brain, uh, if not for the adults, but for sure for the kids. So what we are doing, we even have in the classrooms more Wi-Fi, more Bluetooth, mobile phones, even at home. We have our Wi-Fi and uh, all that technology based on high frequency. So we are spending a lot of monies and ideas to protect the environment. But we do not even think on protecting our kids. Because the technology is quite near. Photons coming from the sun. They will not hurt us, they will not harm us. We already have one very famous photonic control at home, that's the remote control for the TV. Based on that ideas, we could create projects in substituting these high frequency mobile phones against optical working ones. We can have, for instance, in the room, an optical receiver, and it should work. We have the technology, but we need to wake up the responsible persons about this fact. We, from the photonics community, we have the abilities and we have the potential to create a new era of optical mobile phones. It can even start with a simple project for students, demonstrating in the lab the communication between two mobile phones. And then you're going to your ministry or to other uh, centers where you can fund some money for that. Very interesting. And another thing what we have seen here, the engineers are working basically with optical fibers guiding the light in fiber. They are using the light. And let's see how uh, physicists are doing the job working with photons. We are going to a laser lab to Amsterdam in the Netherlands, closed doors, security, because we expect open laser radiation. Most of you all know such sceneries, controlling light, Aligning light, you see here woods of alignment and adjusters which need to be trained to the students as well. And the beautiful light, and this shows us that the Researchers or the physicists in the laboratory are working, walking, not wa working, in a different way with the photons. Yeah. If we see now photonics for physicists, photonics for engineers, and I did not touch the big upcoming area, the uh, biology. So, is it still correct to consider the photonics as part of the physics? In my opinion, I must say no. Meanwhile, the photonics is grown up. It's leaving the home of the physicists. You see, photonics with the engineers, photonics and telecommunication. So the photonics became an own standing discipline, like the electronics did. Electronics also came out of the lab of the physicists, and we have to develop new ideas to meet the steadily growing demand 
in Kotonis. So this is an approach to that. So it's a photonic center. This photonic center has been planned by myself and has been built as it is here. And the basic idea behind that is how I can implement photonics in a country where no photonic industry is available. So if you go with a good idea to the ministry and saying, okay, what uh, I need money, I want to create a photonic research, I want to create photonic uh, units. And then the minister will ask, who needs it in our country? This is uh, the standard answer for that. So we need something which is own standing. And at the beginning I mentioned photonics is a combination of mechanics, electronics and optics. And you see we have all these workshops around the scientific center even we have own workshops for optical coating, fine mechanics workshop, surface treatment, of course, information technology, electronics workshop, PCB development, and of course, training. Such a unit can be used already to start the production of small units, and it can be considered as a breeding farm for new companies and they still can let them produce their needs in this center. So, but of course we need science and research. This is the center group. We need, <coughs> for instance, to have a scientific group, group for interaction, larger matter, material processing, telecommunication, metrology, remote sensing, laser sources, laser medicine, and laser biology. It depends on the uh, qualification which shall be obtained. And in fact, it appears to me that uh, an own standing photonic center is the way out of the disaster if you consider to get the physicists from one university, the electronic people from another university, and immediately start a fight between the universities and it will not work. So you need an own standing facility to grow the photonics technology in the country. So here we see the final uh, example of such a photonic center which exists here with the workshops and in the center we have then the scientific courses and we should never forget great science, thank you, great science means always standing on the shoulders on those who came before. And with your engagement as teacher, you lift your students to the top of your shoulder and make great science happen. And to honor a bit those who came before, and that's why we are celebrating the Year of Light 2015. Ibn al Haytham, basically 1,000 years of his work. We have to honor Fresnel. And uh, in fact, uh, I was not correct. So the Libel Company was founded in 850, and Einstein, 1905, just for his photoelectric effect, and as well, Penzias and Wilson, the discovery of the cosmic wave background. This was one of the inventions I really like. You know, microwave. They have such a big horn, and you see even here, the uh, receiver station, maybe they even slept in that room, I have no idea. But it happened that they measured a specific noise. And first of all, they believed birds were inside and made some shit. Uh, so they started to clean that, but still this noise was present. And later on, in connection with other observers, they could verify that this is the background radiation coming from outside to us, to the Earth. 
to mention also Mr. Cao. He received the Nobel Prize and he was a hard worker on optical fibers. He reduced dramatically the, the losses in the fibers and made, in fact, the internet possible. Okay, this we already had. And before I'm closing, I would like to show you a work of students. I like that. It's a favorite of mine. These students, they did not want to wait until they get the laser into their hand. They made their own laser. Let's see how they did that. Hi, Kickstarter. Hi, everybody. We are Jenny, Thea, and Philip. And this is Mr. Beam, a do-it-yourself laser cutter and engraver kit that cuts and engraves paper, wood, plastic, and other materials. Our motivation for this project was to maximize the working area as much as possible while keeping costs to a minimum make it portable and add some other nice features we will introduce in this video. Before we are ready to show you Mr. Beam in action, we have to put our safety glasses on. Laser cutters are fun, but also a serious tool. Very simple, but very genius. He's driving on chocolate. Beautiful. On the skateboard. On the shoes, even. Mr. Beam comes in two sizes. Mr. Beam Junior is one sheet letter size. Whereas Mr. Beam Senior has a working area four times letter size. Mr. Beam comes with a laser diet that can cut and engrave paper, foil, foam rubber, wood, leather, and a lot of other materials. But the overall setup is designed for high power laser diets as well. We wanted Mr. Beam to be as mobile and portable as possible. Therefore, the laser cutter provides a lot of different and unusual This is again a very good idea to write the name on your stick. we designed him to work with your tablet or smartphone via a web interface. The heart of the system is an Arduino Uno, a Raspberry Pi, and the Mr. Beam Shield. All software used to run the system is open source. Many of the parts are 3D printed. The mainframe is made out of wood and metal parts you can get in a hardware store. The mechanical and electronic parts are available online. That's Mr. Beam. We finished the third prototype and we want to continue to work on the following issues. Refine and finalize the Mr. Beam shield to run a production that makes the single piece more affordable. Improve the product design in relation to ease of use, assembly, and the production of the parts. Simplify the software. For example, the web interface to make the use of laser cutters easy and enjoyable for everyone. We need your help to keep on going and get Mr. Beam on your desk. We hope you will join us. Thank you very much. A brilliant idea. I mean, these laser sources for the cutting, these are blue laser dyes, you can buy them on eBay meanwhile for $50, $60, with an upper power of one watt. Great, I like that, students. And unfortunately, time is a bit short. Biophotonics, a great, great new upcoming story. I had the pleasure to uh, attend the Clio conference this year in uh, San Jose where the Nobel Prize winners talked about biophotonics uh, uh, bringing down the barriers of the optical revolution down to uh, uh, molecule size. But we are celebrating here the Year of Light and I already got the 10 minutes sign. 
Thank you so much for your patience and your kind attention. And never forget what I learned here. Viva de Luz. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Walter Lutz, for our excellent presentation. And to demonstrate how my laser pointer works. It works in the same way like that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, that's true. Absolutely. So we have time for some questions. Any questions? Is it students that you're getting? Is that? Oh, but let me ask you a question. Do you understand? Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you understand now what a laser is? Yeah, good. So, thank you very much. This is my, my pride. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. It's your thought? No, but they will keep talking. So, I think if anybody wants to go through the... Yes, come on. Yes. Come on. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a great pleasure for me.